Hello and welcome to another episode of Forkful of Noodles. I am Krish Mohan. Tis the season. That's a phrase we hear a ton of this time of year, right? Tis the season to participate in consumerism, to show how much you really love someone. Because the only real way to show the abstraction of love is to spend something based in nothing, wrap it up in decorative paper, so everyone knows it's real. Tis the season to get chastised for saying Merry Christmas. And yeah, if you don't celebrate Christmas, that can get obnoxious, right? But it isn't the Crusades. So if you don't really celebrate the holiday, tell that person what you celebrate or what you'd like to be greeted with. Tis the season to be more empathetic, to educate people and offer some redemption. Actually, that's what all seasons should be about and while we're distracted with how much the holidays is going to put into the debt of the consumerist cycle or what greeting your barista should say to you our rights get stripped away one by one tis the season that actual freedom becomes a thing of the past the first thing on the chopping block is our internet freedoms sure yes i have endlessly talked about how important it is to keep net neutrality and regulate internet service providers like Verizon and Time Warner to charge consumers for that utility, but that didn't really stop the Federal Communications Commission to revoke net neutrality and Title II in the name of profits. Chairman of the FCC, Ajit Pai, claims it's because he wants the government to stop micromanaging the internet service providers and give people choices over their internet. But if the ISP weren't like children that keep putting cherry bombs in the internet anthill, the government could trust them enough not to micromanage them. This is a reminder, if you like having content like this show, Act Out with Eleanor Goldfield, Redacted Tonight with Lee Camp, Democracy Now!, or even The Ben Shapiro Show on the internet, you're going to want to keep net neutrality in place. What this does is let companies like Verizon and Comcast charge whatever they want for quicker access to independent content and sites they don't particularly care for. Sure, they can't censor it, but they can slow it down to a crawl. You know, slow, slow down videos and websites, pages, profiles, all those things will be slowed down to a crawl to make it much more difficult to get that content. And yes, some people will say that it's not being blocked off the internet, but have you interacted with another human being before? I mean, most people don't have the patience to wait for something to load for more than like a second or two. If it takes longer than two seconds, you might as well set your computer on fire because the rest of the day is ruined and wasted. Okay, we're all on a very tight schedule to watch cat videos and Star Wars memes this holiday season. If if the FCC wants to give more control over to the corporate sector, they should start a fund called People's Patience for Profits. Sure, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai likes to say that corporations won't be creating slow and fast lanes for the internet because corporations have been so good and kind to the people. But the fact is that corporate ISPs were slowing internet down before this decision was ever made. Charter Communications was suing Time Warner back in November of 2017 for not providing internet speeds they were promised. Net neutrality would mean that Time Warner would be in the wrong for not being transparent on what they can and can't deliver. Corporate ISPs are like that friend that promises to take you to the airport and help you move or even feed your cat. But through a series of excuses and lies, they drop the ball and you miss your flight and have to move all your shit yourself and bury your cat. If you really wanted to get rid of that friendship, you should bury your cat in your former friend's front yard. In small towns, you know, the internet speeds are already slower compared to bigger cities. I was in a small town outside Des Moines, Iowa, and a video that normally takes about five minutes to upload took about four hours. And 
these towns don't have too many options on who their internet service providers are. So if Comcast and Verizon didn't want to give faster service to Iowans under net neutrality, then what choice does Iowa really have? I mean, it's no wonder that when you go to small towns, they look like they're stuck in the 80s. And, and so what you do see in competition in broadband, among broadband providers, uh, the most competition is among the wealthiest markets because those are the people who are going to possibly pay more money for a, a higher quality connection. So if you're a small provider trying to compete in a charter legacy market, it's a very difficult thing to do. You're not going to invest in poorer areas. You're going to invest in the wealthiest areas. And that's not necessarily anyone's fault. That's just the nature of what competition looks like in this kind of infrastructure, right? So you end up with... That's how information is controlled for these folks. It's kept slow, and any smaller ISP that is looking to advance technology is blocked by the big guy that can charge more for faster service. And it creates an even larger divide between fast city slickers and the simple life of small townies. Obviously, Ajit Pai has never been outside the bubble that his Verizon master set up for him, where they just show him videos of parents exploiting their children's dental care and baby pandas sneezing and pages after pages of Amazon's goods. I mean, it would explain why his own video was this. Hi, I'm Ajit Pai. I'm the chairman of the FCC. Recently, there's been quite a bit of conversation about my plan to restore internet freedom. Here are just a few of the things you'll still be able to do on the internet after these Obama-era regulations are repealed. You can still gram your food. And Quality. Are you selfie or just... You can still post photos of cute animals, like puppies. <laughs> you can still shop for all your Christmas presents online. Yes, got that bulk deal on fidget spinners. Yes, those Eclipse glasses are so cheap. You can still binge watch your favorite shows. You can still stay part of your favorite fan community. Notice that Pi is saying that the internet can only be used for buying more shit. You can't learn about history or science, dissent or anything relevant. Just fill those voids with more shit you probably don't need. Look how cool this corporate puppet looks with a lightsaber and an ethernet and fiber optics cable jammed up his ass so the instructions from his overlords get to his brain in lightning speeds. Now, so this year for Christmas, Ajit Pai and the FCC got the American people the gift of silence. Taking away net neutrality means our freedom of speech is under attack and has been sold off with a very nice bow to the highest bidder. Eventually, this will lead to imprisonment for not saying the right holiday greeting. Now, companies like Facebook, Google, Twitter have all come out against the FCC, but I doubt it's in the interest of us, the consumers. This battle is about who controls the massive information highway. At this point, most people know that Facebook, Google, Twitter censor the reach of independent media, so unless they're willing to throw their weight around in money towards preserving net neutrality, I doubt their decisions are based on our internet freedoms. It is very much about the control of information being in their favor. But there is a glimmer of light from the darkness of Ajit Pai's reign of corporate trollism. New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman is suing the FCC for this ruling. And this is one of like 70 lawsuits against Pai. Also, Congress can overturn it within 60 days. So basically to foil the plot of a Pi to make everyone have an AOL email account and prove once and for all that the internet 
is a fad just like all our grandpas have been saying. We have two months for Congress to band together and for once do the right thing. And also hope that this lawsuit goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. There's also the option of a municipal public broadband network. Municipal broadband would be a, a broadband, preferably a fiber network, that is um, built, owned uh, by a municipal government, and in many cases an electric utility. Which, by the way, having an electric utility uh, run a, a broadband network is a great idea because um, uh, not only does that ensure that it's going to connect to every home and business if it's on the back of the electrical grid, but you can actually connect them so that there's, there's the electrical grid itself has internet connection and you can get instant data off of it. You can reroute power more easily, um, reduce the duration of outages. Um, but yes, yeah, so that would be a municipal broadband network would be one specifically uh, built and run by a municipal government, whereas public broadband, I'm using a bit more loosely, um, that could also, you know, be like a county broadband network, or if there's nothing like this that exists, but like one run by a state, for example, or a, or a rural electric cooperative. Do you feel yeah. that municipal is the best, the smaller, the, the, the locale, the better? So most of the public broadband networks that exist in the United States are in pretty small municipalities. I think that this sort of mid-sized city, you know, smaller city is, is, is actually, actually a great place to start doing this kind of thing because um, the investment is not so huge that it's the initial investment's not going to be so huge that it's totally overwhelming, but the market's going to be large enough to actually sustain the network and make it profitable. And then from there, it can actually grow out into expanding communities and start, start to serve outlying towns and rural areas. This is actually something that was happening organically, not just in Chattanooga, but outside of um, Wilson, North Carolina, with their municipal broadband network. They were this means that things like the internet would be in the hands of the people that use it. The consumers, the public, the proletariat. The power of information is at our fingertips. Tis also the season to con the American people into thinking that poor people are stealing their money. House Speaker and King Republican Paul Ryan says that he'll be working on entitlement reforms for 2018. Now, don't get too excited. He's not really going to make Donald Trump Jr. get a minimum wage job so he can see how shitty it is. You know, where we all watch Trump Jr. have a panic attack over an Egg McMuffin and spend his 30-minute break crying in front of everyone in the drive through lane screaming, I shouldn't have to work this hard for so little money. Well, no one does, Donnie. Now get back to the fryers. These burgers won't flatten themselves. Paul Ryan wants to cut Medicaid, Medicare, and any program that tries to help poor people sa to save the American budget. Now, this is not a new Republican tactic. This is the same tactic that's used every time it comes to actually helping people, equating social programs with robbing the American people and keeping the country in debt, creating a stigma towards anything that resembles compassion. So the only choice that's out there for the American people is cutthroat competition. Now, Ryan claims this is how you tackle debt and deficit. Well, while we're cutting things that create a deficit, how about we cut that overinflated war budget that keeps getting more and more bloated every single year? Or maybe the Republicans could come up with a tax bill that actually helps the American people instead of rehashing trickle-down economics, which has never worked because American capitalism works on greed, poverty, and debt. But that's the grand old party for you. There's only one word that truly describes this party. Old. And just the regular old, not the fancy kind with the E at the end of it. You can't really call them grand. I mean, no one really equates prestige or excellence with the party that had a hand in killing the middle class and wants to kill even more people with the wars they fund. And if Congress people like Paul Ryan think that the party is grand, that's because they have delusions of grandeur. 
They're only looking through the one eye that's located on the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. I mean, it's not really a party either, right? I mean, no one wants to invite the eradicator of compassion to the BYOB party where everybody is sharing their booze and their food and their drugs. And if a Republican showed up, they probably try to figure out how to sell the party to the next highest bidder, tax every drop of booze, and create a crisis for profit with all the drugs at the party. So all they are is old, constantly convincing you that ideas that didn't work 30 years ago will work today. Trickle-down economics would work if we were able to agree that there are some principles of socialism that have value in this system. If trickle-down is to work, then the ultra-rich corporatists and capitalists would actually give those tax savings to help the American middle class buy those things that Ajit Pai wants us to get from the internet. You know, use the internet the way that the FCC really wants us to use it. We need the help of these trickle-down corporatists to do that. Help Ajit Pai, won't you? Won't you help Ajit Pai? You are literally his last hope, American corporatists. Basically, Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell would have to go through everybody's Amazon wish list and deliver those gifts to our homes, which means that there is a way for Santa to exist, and that is through real trickle-down and job creation. Well, for like one day, for like a day. If, they, if that can exist for like a day, then yeah, we can all say that Santa is real. Also, it would mean that these corporations can't use their offshore tax havens that both the Paradise and the Panama Papers revealed and discussed. The next thing, just as important. They are going to give an incentive for companies that have earned profits over the last 20 years, but kept them in an account outside the United States. Not that many years ago, a law was written by these companies which said, if you earn profits abroad, which in these days American companies do a lot of, and you keep the profits in an account overseas, you don't have to pay any profits tax at all. You only have to pay the profits tax if and when you bring the profits back into the United States, called repatriating your profits. So companies that either do a lot of business abroad or can fake the documentation they don't pay any taxes until they bring it home. And so the Trump administration is saying, in order to get you to bring it home, we're going to give you a special deal. If you bring it home, say in 2018, you will only have to pay, and they're not negotiated that, 5% or maybe 10. And let's make sure we all understand. This is a reward for not paying taxes for 25 years because you didn't pay, because remember, for 25 years, we're talking trillions. Who are the biggest holders of money abroad? Some of you have seen these stories. Google, Amazon, Apple, all of them. The ones with the social consciousness, who's are concerned about the country and its future, are robbing you blind. Rewards for robbery. I mean, this is real and the, the real entitlement problem. Thinking that you can hide your money and not contribute to the people that work for you and help you make all that money you're hiding, right? And then, and then you get a reward for breaking the law. That's entitlement and the Republicans are just fine with that. But if you're a widowed mother of three on welfare and Medicare, then you are said to be suckling at the raw teats of Mother America. Basically, these corporations learned their savings methodologies from pirates. They hid them in these islands and drew a map with dotted lines shaped like a middle finger to let the American people know that they're all about fucking us. So the argument comes down to who do you trust? The private or the public sector? Corporations or the government to provide for the people? But it's one and the same. Our own a government is owned by the corporate sector. And the fact that Congress didn't immediately overturn the FCC's rulings means that 
They're in the pockets of corporations. The government tells us that we need to go to work for corporations that make more money and then they pay you just so Republicans can say they were job creators. Why not create some jobs that matter? If the Republican Party wants to save itself and the American people, then they should look at the state of progress and adapt. If you lost your job to automation or the fact that coal mining jobs are no longer necessary, the government with the corporate sector should help retrain and re-educate certain people. There is no supply for that job you used to do, and the demand is to adapt. Singing the tune of job creation and tax cuts for the rich, the Republicans are saying that corporations will save the day when neither side will. The private and the public sector are working in tandem to ensure that we the people don't have choices but the options we are told to choose. That's why they keep pushing the two-party system, right? It's why we only have two choices for the internet and it's why we are constantly battling over coke or pepsi when rc cola is just fine or or better yet root beer root beer is the best way to go i mean it's a refreshing soda it's made out of vanilla and probably real sugar it's delicious why are we having this argument the only choice is root beer and these are just two examples of how the government wants to strip your rights away the right of information, and a healthy living. And look, I've kept it to two because it's the holidays. And also, that's how many things the standard American mind seems to be able to handle at one time. And these are right-wing ideas. And as much as the right claims to be for a limited government, it seems like they're all for controlling our lives. The only thing they want to limit is our health, knowledge, and the fact that politicians and government agencies should be representing us. So, tis the season to keep our eyes open, your ears tuned in, and not to forget about these issues. Tis the season to bring these conversations to the dinner table and talk about what's going on. If 2017 has taught us anything, it's that complacency means we lose. It means that we pause our own progress, and the only thing we're left with is outrage. Tis the season to get educated, start communicating, and join the fight. That's been your Forkful of Noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a like and uh, give us a share. Sharing is caring. Uh, sharing is a great way to spread the, spread the word of things that you think are important uh, that people should hear. Uh, so if you enjoyed it, share it around. Uh, I have live stand-up comedy shows coming up in Indianapolis, Indiana, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Richmond, Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia, Knoxville, Tennessee, and Memphis, Tennessee. For all of my tour dates, you can go to ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. While you're there, you can pick up all of my stand-up comedy albums, uh, and you can support the this show by uh, either making a one-time donation uh, or by becoming a uh, sustaining member as public radio likes to say uh, by joining our patreon uh, the patreon will help fund this show um, help start a community around uh, a lot of these big topics uh, start conversations within within the the patreon groups uh, about these ideas and topics covered in this show uh, and it will help me, you know, earn a living off of all this stuff. So if you would like to uh, support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash Haha. Ha. Uh, this is the last Forkful of Noodles for 2017, so I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, what we are going to do next week is a best of 2017 episode, uh, and then we are going to be right back into uh, new episodes. Uh, we're going to try changing the format up in the next few months um so keep your eyes peeled for for a little bit of a change in in the formats uh, a couple of longer episodes maybe covering two or three issues within one episode we're also going to be looking for sponsors and more patrons uh as uh the months go on so 
Uh, once again, Ramen Noodles Comedy. That's R A M A N Noodles Comedy dot com for tour dates, comedy albums, all the updates for Forkful of Noodles and my podcast. And if you would like to support these shows, uh, in DIY, independent, non corporate comedy content, go to Patreon dot com slash Krishmohan. Ha ha. Thanks for getting into it.